Well, here we go again, a book of Exodus uh, for beginners. Uh, we're at chapter nine, not chapter nine, but lesson nine in the series. And this uh, title of this lesson, The Exodus, Journey to Sinai. So finally, they're going to start moving. And our, um, our passage of scripture is Exodus 15, if you're following along in your Bibles, 15 to 18. So we left off at the account of Moses parting the sea to allow the people to cross on a dry sea bottom with a wall of water on both sides of the Israelites. Once across, Moses, if you recall, raises his staff and the waters covered and drowned the Pharaoh and his army who were pursuing the Israelites. And uh, they chose to cross on the pathway that God had miraculously opened up for Moses and his chosen people. And I think the thought must have struck them at one, one point, you know, uh, wait a minute, what are we doing here? The, the, there are walls of water on either side of us. You know, the, the reality of the, si the situation. And of course, uh, they tried to reverse course, tried to return, the chariots got stuck and uh, the uh, water washed over them and took their lives. And so we finished by reading the song written by Moses to celebrate their freedom and the response by his sister Miriam, all of this to commemorate God's great victory over Pharaoh and his army. This moment of rejoicing was not long lived as the people were now faced with a trek into the wilderness to reach the land promised to them by God through Moses. And so we'll read uh, chapter three, uh, 15 to 17. It says, God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob have sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial name to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite to a land flowing with milk and honey. And there was the there was the promise of the land. And finally, uh, Moses is saying, now's the time to lead you to this particular land. Well, in this first passage, uh, if we fast forward to Exodus 15, in this first passage, after the dramatic events that enable them to be free from uh, Egyptian slavery, we witness the beginning of God's dealing with his people. So far, his focus and miracles have been directed at the Pharaoh and his nation. The Jews have been witnesses and benefactors of God's dealings with the Egyptians. In this section, we have a summary of how God will deal with his chosen people and how he expected them to respond to him. So let's go to Exodus now chapter 15 and read uh, beginning in verse 22. It says, then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah for they were bitter. Therefore it was named uh, Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses saying, what shall we drink? Then he cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree and he threw it into the waters and the waters became sweet. There he made for them a statute and a regulation, and there he uh, tested them. One more verse, it says, and he said, if you will give earnest, uh, earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, the Lord, am your healer. Then they came to Elim, uh, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 date palms, and they camped there beside the waters. Okay, there's the entire passage. All right, so the first, uh, the first order of uh, business was to find water for themselves and uh, their animals. 
when they have traveled three days to a place where there should be water, they find that the water is bitter, uh, marrow. So if you follow down from uh, Ramses uh, down to Succoth and where they crossed over, uh, Baal Zephon, and then they go down to Mara. This is the, the first place that uh, there's uh, some dialogue that uh, takes place. Um, they find that the water is bitter. Mara means bitter or salty. Here is where we see a familiar pattern begin in the interaction between Moses and the, and the people. The people immediately grumble and complain and they direct their frustrations towards Moses, asking, uh, maybe not even asking, but demanding that he find a solution. Moses, to his credit, does not defend himself or argue back with the people. He immediately cries out to God for help, something that the, that the people should have done. Moses had no power. He, he was only God's spokesman to deliver messages from God to the people. The people had overestimated Moses' power and authority. Their faith should be in God, not, not, in, not in Moses. But God answers Moses' prayer for help in one of two ways. First, practical knowledge. He teaches him a primitive way to desalinate water. The word tree here in verse 25 can mean part of a tree or brambles or cut pieces of a tree. And it turns out that wood charcoal from the acacia trees, which were plentiful in that area, uh, were also useful in desalinating water, thereby making it fit to, uh, to drink. And then there's a miracle. God could have miraculously transformed the bitter water into potable drinking water with Moses you know, putting a tree or wood in the water as a symbolic gesture, just like raising his staff to divide the sea was a symbolic gesture and not the cause of the sea separating. So we're not, we're not sure which of these was the cause for the purifying of the water. However, the point to remember for the people here was that they needed to make their needs and their fears known to God, not just to Moses. God was their leader. And as he says in verse 26, he was also their healer. So Moses notes at the end of verse 25 that God summarizes the nature of the relationship he will have with his people from this time forward. In simple terms, if, if they will obey him, he will take care of them and he will protect them from physical illness and harm. He even says, you know, he will be their healer. As a practical demonstration of this promise, God through Moses leads them to a pleasant oasis in the wilderness with plenty of water and shade and fruit to eat. And so there's a kind of a happy ending there to this uh, particular drama. We continue now in chapter 16, uh, where uh, the story of, or the, um, yes, the story of the Lord providing manna is found. We read uh, chapter 16, verses one to three. It says, then they set out from Elim and all the congregation of the sons of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departure from the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The sons of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt. When we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Well, we see them, you know, they leave Egypt in a hurry without provisions for a long journey. They've been traveling about a month and they're running low on supplies. They're not wanting to eat their breeding stock, which they will need when they arrive, when they settle in the promised land. The familiar pattern of complaining against Moses, but this time suggesting that he somehow brought them into the wilderness to starve them to death you know, applying evil motives to him in addition to their accusation. It demonstrates how quickly people can turn on their leaders 
when things go wrong. So we continue reading in verse four. Then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. Note that God again responds to Moses by summarizing what he's going to do. He's going to provide meat and bread in a miraculous fashion. And the primary reason that he'll do this, not only to provide daily food in a geographical area where there is no food available or uh, no food to be grown, they're in the wilderness, he will also provide food this way in order to test if the people will be obedient to him. And so in the following verses, Moses records the Lord's instructions concerning the gathering of the manna, as well as Moses' exhortations to the people about their attitude. So first, the people were to gather each morning what they would need of the manna, and the, man, the word manna means what is it, each day, uh, each morning, they would uh, collect the manna for that day according to the size of their family. One omer, uh, today we'd say two quarts roughly, per person. If they collected more in order to stock up, then the extra amount would spoil the next day. On the sixth day of the week, which would be Friday, they were to collect enough for two days and in this case, the extra collected would not spoil, it would keep. Next, the Lord also covered their camp with quail in the evening for them to collect and to cook or to roast as a portion of meat. Moses reiterates that their grumbling about food should not be directed at him or Aaron, but to God. And he also reminds them that God hears their grumblings and will answer them not with punishment, but with kindness um, uh, by providing the quail, that's it, by providing the quail in the evening and the bread or the manna uh, in, the, uh, in the morning. And so the manna, uh, it looked like frost on the ground, which appeared like coriander seed and it tasted like honey wafers and it was white in color. It could be ground in order to bake into cakes or it could be boiled uh, to form uh, noodles. It was designed to satisfy hunger, which it did each day for those who gathered it. Whatever was left uncollected on the ground melted away with the heat of the sun. However, no matter how much was needed and collected, there was always enough, even on the day that the people had to collect enough to last them two days. And so in the next section, uh, God is going to give instructions concerning the Sabbath and how it is to be observed. So chapter 16, we go to verse 22. Moses writes, now on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers for each one, when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, then he said to them, this is what the Lord meant. Tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will and boil what you will boil and all that is left over put aside to be kept until morning. So they put it aside until morning as Moses had ordered and it did not become foul nor was there any worm in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. We see then that the Israelites had been slaves in Egypt, and as such, they worked seven days a week. Uh, you know, there was no day off for worship of any kind or rest of any kind. This is the first time that Sabbath, which means to cease or to rest, is mentioned in the Bible in this context. The observance of the Sabbath is introduced in conjunction with the gathering of food in order to survive. In order to set the day aside as a special day, a holy day, 
God would provide enough manna on Friday so that two days worth could be collected and stored without, without spoilage. Furthermore, there would be none available on the seventh day to gather, even if they went out looking for it. This ordinance was established before the various commands for worship were given. So that at this point, the purpose of the Sabbath was to introduce a day of, uh, a day of rest from work. Let's keep reading in verse 27. It came about on the seventh day that some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore he gives you bread for two days on the sixth day. Remain every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Of course, as they were used to doing, many of the people went out to search for manna on the seventh and they found none. Perhaps they were lacking in faith. Maybe they were curious. Maybe they wanted to hoard. God speaks to the people through Moses explaining that the reason they were to collect two days worth on Friday and bake and boil it on that day was because none would be available on the Sabbath day and none would be available on that day because God wanted his people to rest and to stay home on the Sabbath. Now, the interesting thing is that none of the religions of that time featured a command from pagan gods to their worshipers that they needed to take a day off each week in order to rest. The Israelites were unique in this regard. And it was one thing that the surrounding nations noticed about them that was different. In giving this command in conjunction with the way he provided food for his people, one day, one day at a time, and then two days worth on Friday to allow for a day of rest on Saturday, the Sabbath, God was teaching his people to depend on him for their needs, even their most basic needs, uh, like food and, and, and rest. And so Moses summarizes the episode by explaining the features of manna and that this miracle should be commemorated by placing some in a jar which would eventually be placed in the Ark of the Covenant, which would also hold the tablets of the Ten Commandments and rest uh, in the Holy of Holies uh, in, the, uh, in the tabernacle. So Moses concludes by confirming that the Jews eventually accepted and followed these instructions about manna and the Sabbath day throughout their 40 years in the desert and they stopped eating manna only when they arrived at the border of the promised land. By the way, an omer or a tenth of an ephah again is a, about a cup. Then we go to another miracle. We have the manna, we have the quail, another miracle, water from a rock in chapter 17. If we look at the map, we note that God is leading Moses and the people to a specific place, which is Mount Sinai, where he will give them a witness of his presence and his power, as well as a key element in their identity as a people. And that will be their moral code embodied in the 10 commandments. This will be, as I said, a key element in their identity as not only a people, but as his people. So if you just follow down Mara, that's where the bitter water was, Elim, that's where the, uh, uh, you know, the oasis was. And where they are heading is uh, there at the bottom that uh, you see Mount, uh, Mount Sinai. In the meantime, two other events take place that Moses records, one of which involves the people's constant need for water and how this need reveals this young nation's lack of faith. So in chapter 17, we read beginning in verse one. Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel journeyed by stages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. And there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? 
Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water and they grumbled against Moses and said, why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord saying, what shall I do to this people? A little more and they will stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not? So this was the fourth time that the people quarreled uh, against uh, Moses or quarreled with him, if you wish. A reminder of the four episodes. First, they blamed him when instead of releasing them at Moses' insistence, the Pharaoh increased their workload. They had to gather their own straw. So they, they quarreled with him then. Then they complained when they were trapped between the sea and the Egyptian army. Again, they said, did you bring us out here just to kill us? We, we, we could have just stayed in Egypt. The third time they blamed Moses and complained when they arrived at Marah and found that the water was bitter and undrinkable at that place. And then this time they grumbled against Moses when in the wilderness of sin, they were running low on food and didn't know how they would be fed. Of course, each time God through Moses would provide for them or make good on his promise to them. And this time was no different, except this time God wanted credible witnesses to his response in addition to Moses. One problem was that the people doubted that Moses and his uh, assigned leadership from God, they, they, they weren't sure that he was really uh, you know, sent by God because they always complained about him. Disputing was, with Moses was test, uh, tantamount to uh, testing God himself. This time God instructs Moses to bring the elders of the people to come with him to witness the miracle. So they, and not only he, could report back deeply into the population what God had done and they had seen with their own eyes and not simply a report from Moses or Aaron. Uh, so you have many elders who will tell others and others who will tell, you know, the word is gonna spread that uh, indeed a miracle was performed uh, through Moses by God. And there were many witnesses to the miracle in order to calm this uh, continual quarreling of the people. And so with everyone in place, Moses strikes the rock with his staff, the same staff with which he parted the Red Sea and the water flowed from the rock as a source. And there was enough water to provide for all of the people. Now the passage says that Moses named the place Massa, meaning test and Mirabah, meaning quarrel. In essence, the quarrel with Moses had been to settle the issue if God was really with them or not. Is God with us or not? Are you his re representative or not? And so this miracle here uh, not only provided water for the people, but it also provided proof that God was with them. And Moses was God's spokesperson. So despite the miracle of the water from the rock, this question would be asked and answered in a variety of ways uh, as uh, their 40 years in the desert would show. At this point, of course, they're not anticipating being in the desert for 40, for 40 years. They're anticipating making the journey to the promised land, which, which was not going to take uh, 40 years. Now, before the people arrive at Mount Sinai and experience the important events which took place there, uh, that would be transformative in nature, uh, two unrelated stories are inserted in Moses' narrative concerning the people's journey into the wilderness. 
The first is uh, a war that they have with Amalek or the Amalekites. And that is in chapter 17, beginning in verse eight. This passage describes this event. So let's read that. It says, then uh, Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose men for us and go out, fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought against Amalek and Moses, Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the uh, hill. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. Then they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and named it, the Lord is my banner. And he said, the Lord has sworn the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. Now the, uh, the Amalekites dwelt in that region, but they were not protecting their homeland. They simply saw an opportunity to attack and plunder a largely defenseless people with no formal military component. Moses instructs Joshua uh, and this is uh, in this place, uh, Joshua is mentioned here for the first time. And so Moses instructs Joshua to muster a military in order to fight the Amalekite army in defending the people. This is the first military action of the young nation. So Moses, as an effort to uh, uh, motivate his inexperienced army, goes to a hill overlooking the battle and holding up his hands with his staff as a sign of prayer and as a sign of encouragement. Uh, the staff, uh, the people uh, recognized, the staff was used in a lot of the miracles that had taken place thus far. And uh, uh, they took courage from this, uh, from this uh, visual. Um, so uh, we learned that uh, so long as uh, Moses' hands stayed up, the Israelites were winning the battle, but when Moses uh, tires and his arms lower, the tide of battle turns. Uh, he's brought Aaron and Ur, um, Josephus, uh, you know, the Jewish historian claims that Ur was uh, Miriam's husband or Moses' brother-in-law. Anyways, these two sit Moses down and they help keep his arms aloft until the victory is won. Because of their treachery, God instructs Moses that there would be continual war with this nation until they were completely wiped out. So there is one uh, episode, the war with uh, the Amalekites. Another episode has to do with Jethro. This section in Exodus 18 uh, verses one to 27, uh, this section explains how the system of government changed from a kind of a benevolent dictatorship with Moses guided by God and represented by Aaron was in charge of everything. Uh, so that system to a more decentralized form of leadership with Moses still the leader chosen and guided by God, but the everyday work of meeting out justice and settling disputes spread out among the various elders and chiefs of the different clans and families. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brings Moses, his wife and sons to where they are camped. Uh, we know that Jethro was a believer and a priest of the true God, and he was recognized as such. We read just a, um, a short verse here uh, or two, verses 11 and 12 in chapter 18, it says, now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. Indeed, it was proven when they dealt proudly against the people. 
Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law before God. So this was a, a high honor uh, for Jethro that the elders and Moses and Aaron would come and eat a meal with him and that he would offer um, a sacrifice. So while they're there, uh, Jethro observes Moses' dealing with all of the responsibilities of leadership uh, by himself. And he warns that Moses will wear himself out since the Lord, or excuse me, the load is too heavy for just one man to carry. Therefore, he encourages Moses to be the people's representative before God and God's spokesman to the people. He then counsels Moses to teach the people in the knowledge and the laws and the statutes and the will of God. And depending on their skill and virtue, assign various men to be leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, and leaders of tens. And as you see in the diagram on your left, this was the system before. Moses was the head and all the people under him and he took care of everything. Then if you look at the diagram on the right, it's a bit of a, an image that uh, represents Jethro's idea. Uh, there would be uh, some of the more mature uh, leaders that Moses would train. They'd be in charge of a thousands, you know, each a thousand people. And then uh, uh, there would be others who would be in charge of a uh, hundred people and 50 people and then down to, to 10 people as a better way to manage such a, a, a large uh, number, of, uh, number of people. They, went to, they were to handle everyday judgments and disputes and uh, bring to him only the important and difficult cases that came before them. Uh, so we read that Moses accepts Jethro's advice. And with that done, Jethro, priest of the true God, returns home to Midian where Moses, his son-in-law had spent 40 years of his life when he had first run away from Egypt. So in our next lesson, Moses and the Israelites will come into the presence of God. This, this first uh, objective, if you wish, uh, they were heading towards Mount Sinai. Next time we're gonna read about what takes place when they finally get to uh, Mount Sinai. But we're gonna stop there and draw perhaps just a couple of lessons here uh, from the material we have talked about uh, this morning. Lesson number one, the people are God's people and the church is God's church. We need to keep that in mind. The people are God's people, the church is God's church. Moses was the chosen leader called upon to do you know, a specific task, but the people themselves belonged to God. He was responsible for feeding them and caring for them. God was, not Moses. In the same way today, the church belongs to God, not to the elders, not to the deacons or even the preachers. Yes, these people, you know, we have a job to do, but God is the one that will make the church stand or fall, not the preachers, not the other servants. Let's remember that in times of crisis so we don't become too discouraged. And let's keep that in mind in times of growth and plenty so we don't fall victim to pride. God is the one that makes the church stand. And if it falls, God is the one who will allow it to fall. Uh, he's responsible. That's why we, we pray for the church. We pray to God to help us serve the church, save the church, keep the church strong. He does that with his, with his spirit. We have, other, we have tasks to do. We, we feed the church, we serve the church, we encourage the church, but whether it stands or falls, that belongs to God because it's his church. Another lesson we gain from this, leaders are always criticized. If you aspire to leadership, be ready for criticism, both deserved and undeserved criticism. 
Don't be surprised if people will not only criticize your performance, but will also suggest that you have evil motives. That is usually the most painful cut of all. It's bad enough that you know, if you're a leader of some kind, people will criticize you. It's when they assign evil motives. You know, he did this because he wanted this bad thing to happen. You know, like Moses, they're saying, you know, yeah, you brought us out here. You brought us out here to kill us. You know? <laughs> that must have been very painful for Moses to, to hear. The only response that works is to stand firm and to faithfully continue in your ministry and to give yourself and your ministry always, always give yourself over to God. But at least if you understand that leaders are always criticized, it doesn't matter if you're a leader in the church, you can be the coach on the team, you can be a politician. If you are a leader, you're the work lead at the factory, well, whatever. Leaders are always criticized. That's a, that's a general rule. So be ready for that. Another lesson, if your prayers to God, in your prayers to God, remember that God provides to satisfy your needs, not your wishes. A big difference. God provided in miraculous ways, the needs of the people for water and food, not their wishes for wine and meats and delicacies that they had enjoyed in Egypt. Some people miss the hand of God working in their lives because it may not be working according to their personal desires. And when that happens, again, you need to remember, God will always provide your needs. He promises, you know, he knows what you need even before you ask it. Now, uh, your wants, your wishes, that's, that's, another, that's another story. And then fourthly, good leaders take advice. Moses, chosen by God, a witness of miracles, and having successfully led two million people out of Egyptian slavery, was humble enough to follow the advice of one who had not advised or achieved or experienced any of these things. Jethro never experienced any of the things that Moses experienced, but in his wisdom, he was able to give uh, Moses uh, sound advice. And Moses was wise enough to take his advice. Today's um, performance coaches, you know, you have coaches you don't just have coaches for sports, but now you have coaches for business leaders or politicians or whatever. Today's performance coaches tell us that the most successful leaders in any area of human endeavor, of human endeavor are not just people who can take advice. I mean, that's important, but people who seek advice from others and have the humility to follow it if they believe that it has merit. In other words, great leaders seek advice. They go out and look for advice. They ask, what do you think? What's your opinion? They find people who have experience or success or knowledge in a certain area and they will seek out that person to ask them, to counsel them so that they can be and continue to be successful leaders. So great leaders seek advice. All right. Well, that's our lesson for uh, this time. Uh, we'll uh, get together next time, uh, lesson number 10, and we'll be talking about what takes place once the people arrive at Sinai. All right. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you next time.